à plusieurs titres, rare par l'étendue de son talent, aussi bien d'essayiste que de romancier. Même, on me dit qu'il a écrit des livres de cuisine. Et, et aussi par le côté rare de sa présence. C'est un auteur qu'on ne voit pas très souvent s'exprimer en public, surtout en Suisse. Et rare, la deuxième rareté de la soirée, c'est que nous avons la chance ce soir d'avoir Thomas Baudemer qui va mener un dialogue avec lui. Alors Thomas Baudemer et Julian Barnes se connaissent depuis très longtemps. Ils ont une connivence certaine, ce qui nous, nous promet une, un échange très, très intéressant et très fructueux. Je laisserai donc à, à Thomas le, la chance de présenter Julian Barnes. Euh, et tout ça se passera en anglais. Mais je, voulais quand même, je tenais à vous adresser ces quelques mots en français. Je vous souhaite une excellente soirée. Merci beaucoup, Vera. En fait, euh, Mme Michalski nous avait demandé si on pourrait faire cette discussion en français. Et comme vous savez, M. Barnes est très francophile, mais le problème, c'est que nous nous connaissons depuis 28 ans. On se parle en anglais depuis 28 ans. Si tout d'un coup, on avait commencé à faire une conversation en français, ça ferait théâtre et bas, pas du bon théâtre. Which is why I'm going to switch to English now. And later on when you can ask questions if there's anybody who doesn't trust his English you can always ask questions in French and then you can translate well <laughs> <laughs> okay um, just to explain to you why why I'm sitting here with Julian Barnes I have to tell you how it all started it started in 1984 when I was editor at a small Swiss German publishing house called Hoffmann's Verlag And one day, a parcel came from England, sent to me by one of our authors, Volker Kriegel, who was also a musician. And I opened the parcel, and there was this book by an author I had never heard of, Flaubert's Parrot. And I thought, well, of course, Volker is a Flaubertian. Of course, he likes this sort of thing. And then I opened this book and started reading the first paragraph which I'm now going to ask you, Julian, to read for us, please. Sure. Six North Africans were playing boule beneath Flaubert's statue. Clean cracks sounded over the grumble of jammed traffic. With a final ironic caress from the fingertips, a brown hand dispatched a silver globe. It landed hopped heavily and curved in a slow scatter of hard dust. The thrower remained a stylish, temporary statue, knees not quite unbent and the right hand ecstatically spread. I noticed a furled white shirt, a bare forearm and a blob on the back of the wrist, not a watch as I first thought or a tattoo, but a coloured transfer the face of a political sage much admired in the desert. Thank you. So, I read this paragraph and I thought, Jesus, there's somebody who can really write. And I kept reading because I, I hardly knew Flaubert at that time, and I'm the living proof that one can read this book without already loving Flaubert. And then what happened was that I finished the book, loved it, But, but then I thought, well, won't the sort of person who loves this kind of book read it in English? And is there any sense in publishing it in, in German? So I gave it to a woman who was the wife of another author and a, an English teacher. And then I waited for her reaction. But in the meantime, I found out Julian Barnes had written two other books before Flaubert's Parrot, Metroland. And Metroland has one of my favorite first sentences. <laughs> It's, there is no rule against carrying binoculars in the National Gallery. <laughs> and, well, I, I, that's how this book continued, and, and I immediately fell in love with that book too. And then there was this other book called Before She Met Me, which is a story about retrospective jealousy. And that also had a fantastic first sentence. It's, 
The first time Graham Hendrick watched his wife commit adultery, he didn't mind at all. <laughs> and then, on top of all this, I discovered that Julian Barnes had also written crime novels under a pseudonym. He called himself Dan Kavanagh when he wrote these novels about a bisexual ex-policeman who is very neurotic. <laughs> and he also <laughs> in, in invented wonderful biographical details about Mr. Kavanagh, that he was born in County Sligo, was an entertainment officer on a Japanese super tanker, a steer wrestler, a waiter on roller skates at a drive-in eatery in Tucson, Arizona, a bouncer in a gay bar in San Francisco. And actually, the books are very good too. It's not just the, the biography. And what happened was that when finally this woman said what she thought about the book, she said, well, we should leave this book to that and that publisher. I won't mention that publisher's name. And then I thought, certainly not. We're going to do Julian Barnes, and we're not only going to do Flaubert's Parrot, we're going to do everything by Julian Barnes. This is how it started. Um, <laughs> that's why we're sitting here. But I was wondering, now that you looked at this paragraph again, I don't know when you last looked at it, how do you feel about it today? No, I haven't looked at that for quite some years, and so it was published in 84, so I must have been writing it almost half my life ago. Um, it's very careful, that's the first thing that strikes me, it's very, very careful, in, the in a good way. <laughs> um, I wouldn't write it like that now. Um, I, like, I like the sentence describing the boo. It landed, hopped heavily, and curved in a slow scatter of hard dust. I think that's very good. I'm, well, you know, you asked me. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to rubbish it completely, am I? Um, I, I, the, I think the, the end bit, I mean, it, it came from watching exactly that scene in the Place des Calmes, which is where Flaubert's statue is, in, um, in Rouen. Um, and I watched them playing bull, and I, I noticed how there's sort of lots of pigeon shit on the head of Flaubert and so on and so forth, and I made lots of notes. Um, I, the two things that, which are sort of work but don't quite work for me now, um, one is that um, he, he, um, he dispatches the, the, the boo with a final ironic caress from the fingertips. And I like the idea that irony is introduced in the third line of the book <laughs> because Flaubert was a great ironist. At the same time, the literary critic in me said, what exactly is an ironic caress of the fingertips? <laughs> you know, Mr. Barnes, would you like to explain <laughs> that in great detail? <laughs> you know, it's a good phrase and it does its work, but I'm not sure it you know, if you hit it, it doesn't sort of resound all the way to the bottom. And the other thing is the end of it, which is um, uh, not be a watch on the wrist, but um, um, in fact, I remember it was a, it was a coloured transfer of Mao Zedong, um, and I thought that's very good because it that introduces politics and um, Flaubert's. Uh, rage against politics, m against most politics, and his uh, pe profoundly pessimistic view of what the future was likely to be in the 20th century. Um, there's one letter where he says something like, um, it will mean the return of religious wars, the old world against the new, the east against the west, why not? That's from a letter written 1860s or something like that. F pretty prescient, you know. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's not always the writer who is deeply involved in the politics of his day who sees the most clearly. Um, so I like the idea that there is that introduced at the end. At the same time, I think the face of a political sage must be admired in the desert is a rather sort of ornate way of saying Mao Zedong. And well, that, I, I didn't and that even now, know it was. And that now, were I writing it, I'd say, you know, as, as he you know, let go of the ball, I, I noticed the face of Mao Zedong. On the other hand, you might then say, were you close enough to see it? <laughs> and so on. But I think it's not bad. 
<laughs> and I thoroughly recommend it if it's on sale <laughs> at the back of the hall. Well, actually, this, the very sentence you like best, and w which was the one where I thought, wow, proved to be the most difficult to translate of the whole book, which says something about it, because it actually recreates the rhythm of what is going on with this bull. Yes, the slow scatter of dust, yeah. Mm. Go on. Um, since we already m jumped from, from Flaubert's time into our century, I would like to jump back and I've been wondering if by means of a time machine you could have met Flaubert, would you have liked to have met him or are you happy that you just have the work and never had to face him? Um, I feel that I have met him because I read his correspondence all four enormous Pleiad volumes of it, which is the most, in my view, the most remarkable writer's correspondence ever. And it's um, Sartre, in a rather overblown Sartrean phrase, called it the first example of free association from a pre-Freudian couch, <laughs> which at least gives some idea of what it's like. They are, they are the most frank, the most blisteringly intelligent, the most relaxed, the most um, obscene, the most covering everything letters that there are. And I think any young writer thinking about the literary life um, could do uh, much worse than read them because uh, on top of finding yourself utterly in the presence of Flaubert, you also are it present at a discussion especially in his letters with Jean Saint, but also with Turgenev, um, of what literature is and what art is about. And you may not agree with his, his thoughts, but all the questions will have been asked for you. you know? There's a famous moment when um, Jean Saint, who were, they were great friends, but they couldn't have been aesthetically more different, Flaubert and Georges Saint, and she's, on the whole, optimistic and believes in the goodness of, of human beings. And Flaubert is generally pessimistic and doesn't think all that much of human beings. And she says to him, uh, you, your work, in your work, you provide desolation and I provide consolation. To which he replies, I cannot change my eyes which is a wonderful exchange. And um, that should, you know, if you, you're starting off, you think, well, actually, what am I up to? What is my view of the world? What is my job as a writer? Am I here to provide consolation or desolation? Of course, my answer to that, since you're going to ask it me, is, <laughs> is that, that in a way, providing desolation, what she would call desolation, which is a truthful examination of the darker side of life and the darker aspects, you provide a kind of consolation that by describing life as it is in, ah, it's Flaubert. Calling, <laughs> uh, please turn off your mobile phones, thank you. Um, it actually would be nice if one could turn off all <laughs> mobile phones. Um, where was I? Yes. Um, so, so by, yes, um, Flaubert says at one point about death, it's only by gazing down, impass not impassively, but constantly at the black pit at our feet that we remain calm. So only by looking at things as they are can we keep uh, psychological stability? And I, I think he would also say, and I would certainly think and agree, that, that, a, that a clear eyed examination of pain, painful things, um, brings in its very exactitude and truth, if you can, if you can get that, uh, a kind of consolation. Did he really say this apropos of death? because that would be most useful for me now, because um, Julian Barnes has been obsessed with death since the age of 16. It's seven. Seven? Yeah. Oh. So, so no, I was a kid. I was, I was really a kid. I was about, I think I was in, I was I definitely prepubescent. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. 
Maybe I wrote something different in another in another book, but uh, no, it started very young. Um, but not as young as a friend of mine who's even more afraid of death than I am. Um, it's always good to have someone who's in a worse spot than you are. <laughs> um, what's, what's your question? You want me to what's say, have I been gazing down at the black peasant? Ha have I remained calm? Um, no, 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 no. I wanted to know why did you become obsessed with death in this case at the age of seven, which I didn't know. Because you suddenly have an imaginative, uh, 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 imaginative prediction of what it is like not to exist. Um, and if, you, if that is fully fills your, your head and your heart, it's a terrifying thing. I'm always surprised that more people don't, aren't, aren't obsessed by death. Uh, just as a Wait, we don't, don't put your hands up. <laughs> it's not that sort of evening. <laughs> no, but I want to, uh, as a parenthesis, the interesting thing is that Julian Barnes is not afraid of dying, but of not being I'm here afraid anymore. Of, I'm not afraid of dying, but I, yes, you, you're either afraid. It seems to be that people think that you either you're either afraid of dying or you're afraid of being dead. And I used to say I'm not afraid of dying as long as I didn't end up dead at the <laughs> end of it. You know, that, that seems to be the catch in the whole business of dying, that you're dead after it. On the other hand, now that I've matured, I realize that I'm afraid both of dying and of being <laughs> dead. So it's got worse rather than better. Um, now, um, I've also written about it. I wrote a book called Nothing to be Frightened I was of, just going to which, say is a, which is a, a, a long, an extended essay about death. And I also translated a wonderful book by uh, Alphonse Daudet, uh, which in English is called In the Land of Pain, and in, in French is called La Doulou, which is a sort of Provençal uh, shortening or sort of um, diminutive for uh, La Douleur, pain. Uh, which he wrote, it was a notebook he kept after his symptoms of tertiary syphilis uh, uh, had declared themselves and that he knew he was condemned. Uh, it's a remarkable document, um, very clear-eyed, humorous, um, much more, um, I, think, I think, much more um, grounded than I would be in the circumstances. But did writing nothing to be frightened of, did that help or not? It certainly helped us, the readers, but how about yourself? Oh, no, I didn't expect it to. I don't, I don't, I don't expect books to help. Uh, I mean, um, you know, but if you get a cheque from the publishers, <laughs> that's a different matter. But, but no, I, I, don't, I, I, I do not believe personally in the, in the therapeutic use of art. I, I know that it does, it, it does work for some people, some certain sorts of artists. I never feel... Um, oh, I've got that off my chest. Mm -hmm. I mean, in that sense, I am a, I am a disciple of Flaubert who said once um, it would be very um, easy and perhaps satisfying to um, get rid of the feelings of Monsieur Gustave Flaubert <laughs> onto the page. But what would be the use of that? <laughs> you know, he was very... He took a, a very... It, a novel is something that you... It's a crafted object out there from which you are as absent as possible. Mm -hmm. like, <coughs> as it says in the portrait of the artist as a young man, you have a creator who then holds back and pairs his fingernails. So th this is a sort of the Flaubertian the, attitude. Uh, uh, well, well, Joyce was a Flaubertian. Mm -hmm. um, How did you become a, a fan of, of French culture and fr French literature? Because both of his parents were French teachers, so that could have been very off-putting. Yes. But obviously it, it, it didn't work that way. There was a time when it was very off-putting, yes. Um, but w when did you fall in love with French culture and French literature? Do you know that? Um, well, I think my first contacts... I mean, I come from a generation... Nowadays, children travel to you know, 15 countries by the time they're seven, and abroad is not mysterious to them anymore. Um, I come from a generation where I went to France with my parents on motoring holidays at the age of about 13, 12, 13. And I didn't go to another country apart from France until I was probably 18 or 19. Um, so it was my primary exotic, France. 
and it was the country by which I not only discovered that things were done differently, but that things could be done better. And it was the, the country and the civilization through which I was then enabled to look back at my own country and, um, and view it more objectively. Um, and I think that's very, I mean, it's, it's, it's easier in somewhere like Switzerland where you have three different groupings all joined four, together. Four, four, four. four. Um, and you've got all these countries around you. But uh, in, 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 in Britain, it's very, it used to be very easy to become um, insular and, uh, and not, not be able to see your own country. And I think having another, having another country uh, as a base for looking is very is very sound. I think it's quite useful for as a writer as well. Mm -hmm. um, so and I haven't really answered your question at all. I realise. And then you so um, so we went there, family holidays, read French school, university, messed up my university years completely. Um, then rather went off it, um, discovered Italy, um, and then I think in my late 20s, early 30s, I started going back to France again and seeing it with my own eyes rather than the eyes of my parents or my teachers or the literature I'd read. Well, you also taught that, there. What? You also taught in France. How old were you then when you were at this Catholic... Oh, I taught... Yes, I, that's true. Well, that's because I messed up my university years and they sent me away for a year. <laughs> uh, which wasn't, you know, nowadays it's normal to do that, but then it was a sort of punishment. Um, and so then I was 20, 21, yes. I, I taught in, in Rennes, in, in Brittany, uh, in a Catholic college. Um, and um, so, so rediscovering it for myself in my late 20s, early 30s, I, I, came, to, I came to love it properly, I think, um, and out of that came Flaubert's Parrot, and yeah. other, 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 other references in other books. Yes, but the Francophilia seems to have begun before that, be because in your first novel, Metroland, you have these two adolescents, in English uh, public school boys, who love French literature, and, and they especially love Écraser l'infâme and Épater le bourgeois, and they sort of are in a competition. Did you écrase anybody today? Did you épat anybody today? Yeah, I and, made and that up. You made that up? Yeah, I made that up. Because it's very unclear to me to what extent this is autobiographical, because every time we talk about it, the percentage of, of how autobiographical it is changes. Yes, <laughs> that's true. I'm a fiction writer. What do you expect? <laughs> um, Yes, I mean, I, I'm sorry, but we have, we have talked publicly on at least two previous occasions, and it is likely that I won't give you the same answers this time as I did last. Mm -hmm. uh, this is always the risk. Um, so today, how much would you say? How, how autobiographical is it? Oh, well, I'd say that the first part of Metroland is very autobiographical in spirit, but not in actual detail. Mm -hmm. And then as it goes on, it gets less and less, and I learn, I learn to write fiction rather than... Um, a disguised version of, of autobiography, which the first part would probably count as, yes. So you were not in Paris in May 1968? No, and I didn't lose my virginity there either. Ah. No. That would have been my next question. So I was once taken by a French television crew. The Flaubert's Parrot was the first book of mine that came in, out in Fran France, and then they did the others, and then they gradually went back to the earlier ones. And so about ten years after this, came out, uh, they did Metroland, my first novel, and I was doing some pr promotion over there, and they took me up to some, somewhere, um, some park in near Montmartre, Butte Chaumont, Butte, is that, is that something like that? Is that right, Butte Chaumont? And, 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 and then they took me from there to a little park, and, and it was freezing cold, it was, light was getting, it was beginning to disappear, and they put me on a bench, and then they started filming me, and I said, can you, can you ask, can you tell me why we've come here? And they said, oh yes, because just over there, that's where you lost your virginity. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, the life of a writer, eh? Um, I didn't know whether to say yes or no, you know? I mean, what's the correct answer? If I said no, it might be spoiling their program. Uh, 
But um, to what extent do you think writing is an avoidance of life? Because this comes up again and again in, in interviews you do, and it's also a question for Flaubert, for example. Yes. Um, he said, you must wade into life as you wade into the sea, but only go in as far as the belly button. Um, I don't think that's true, and I don't think it's probably true of him either. I think he waded sometimes um, until his head was under the water. <laughs> Um, but it was a way of looking at it and a way of explaining his own life. I don't feel that I don't feel that there's a a, a conflict between life and art. I mean, um, the, the in 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 English, in British literature, Irish literature, it's always expressed by in that phrase of Yeats that the artist has to choose between perfection of the life or of the work. Um, I, I think you just try and do your best in both. I don't think that if you perfect your... Well, I can't imagine what a perfect life would be, but I don't imagine if you perfect your life, it makes your art worse. I can't imagine if you perfect your art. I think often it's used as an excuse for behaving badly. <laughs> you know, I'm an artist. Mm -hmm. Can't expect me to behave better, can you? You know, there's a lot of that around in the world, I find. Um, Yes, and there's also the theory that a good artist puts all that is best in him into his work and one should not look at the rest. Yes, there is, I think well, we're, we're moving, or, well, we're partially moving into the realm of, of biography and whether we should be interested in, in a writer's life. Um, Faulkner, a great American novelist, said once that every writer's obituary should be the following. He wrote books then he died <laughs> <laughs> and or she wrote books then she died and and I, I I sort of agree with that I mean fortunately I should be dead by the time any biography appeared because, appears because I shall certainly interfere with anything that is attempted before I'm dead um, um, life the life art, uh, the life art work balance you see I, de I also don't think that that when you're working, uh, writing a novel, um, painting a picture, writing a piece of music, that you're not living. I, I think that often you're living almost at your most intensely then. And you're also, especially in the case of, 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 of writing, you're also deeply involved in, in life, in describing life, in analyzing life, in asking questions about life and human motive, human behavior. So I don't, I don't feel that there's some sort of switch that you have to turn on when you're going into your study and that you switch into artistic mode from having been in living mode. I think that the two just overlap all the time. But didn't you tell us something completely different just today that you yes. switch off that it's not the case that you no, go hiking and still think about the novel you're writing. Yes, we, we walked from Montrichet to Lille and back, and you asked me if I'd been thinking about my books or something like that. And, and I said, when I walk, I walk, and I think about walking. And when I'm in my study, I think about writing books. Um, but it's not, that's, not, that's not what I meant. <laughs> Maybe I'm contradicting myself. Um, I don't think... I, now I'm walking in Switzerland. I'm not writing books. Um, I mean, I might end up writing a short story about walking in Switzerland mm -hmm. with an old friend of mine and his wife. Can and I what quote? they said, <laughs> <laughs> the secrets that they gave away without realizing that they were giving them away. Yes. Well, actually, you already have written that sort of story, one of my favorites. It's in the collection Pulse, and it's called Trespass, and it's about hiking. And uh, 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 the, the main character is a very pedantic hiker. But I would like to quote to you uh, something by a French writer, and I wonder which, how you feel about this. This is a quotation. En lui, aucun sentiment simple n'existe plus. 
tout ce qu'il voit, ses joies, ses plaisirs, ses souffrances, ses désespoirs, deviennent instantanément des sujets d'observation. Il analyse malgré tout, malgré lui, sans fin, les cœurs, les visages, les gestes, les intonations. Sitôt qu'il a vu, quoi qu'il ait vu, il lui faut le pourquoi. Il n'a pas un élan, pas un cri, pas un baiser qui soit franc. How do you feel about this? I'm trying to work out who it is. Does anyone recognize that? Is it 20th century? No. 19th century? Yes. It's not Flaubert. No. No. Um, <laughs> that would have been. That would have been uh, uh, easier. Um, is it late 19th century? Uh, yes. Come on, help. <laughs> well, I can um, help you. Yeah. No, yes. but I was wondering whether this is something you recognize or this is not how you walk through life. No, um, I, uh, I, I don't... Um, that's not how I view the connection between, um, between life and literature. Um, I don't think... I don't think when I'm... Well, we'll make an artificial distinction, but I don't think when I'm living that I am um, being a writer um, at that moment. Um, I'm aware that in the long term, something that happens now might become something of use in the future. But I'm not self-conscious about what I'm doing or how I'm observing people. Because, and, and maybe this is the difference between me and that writer, um, I always find that my ideas for novels and short stories, almost without exception, come from some way back. And I don't know at the time that that is going to be a, a literary subject for me. So, you so, so I, I constantly... I constantly make notes, I keep diaries, I keep travel diaries, I keep work diaries, domestic diaries, all sorts of diaries. But I never write down anything thinking that's an idea for something. There's time always goes by. Some element of composting has to happen before... Uh, before... I think it's partly also that... Um, Quote Flaubert again. Um, he said, "He said there is no form without an idea, and no idea without a form." By which he meant, I understand, um, that you can have you can have an idea for a novel, but until you find the form for it, that moment of ignition has not happened. And equally, you could imagine uh, some formal structure for a novel, but if you didn't have the content, it wouldn't exist. And so. Um, There's, a, there's an initial point of ignition when you see something, hear something, write something down, and then any number of years can go by, and you find somehow that a way of telling that story or a way of using that story in a formal sense comes into your mind, and that's the point at which the writing starts. So I think I'm lucky in not having that... Do you remember that? Um, Tommy is a great film expert. Um, the, there's a, um, a, a Bergman comedy um, in which uh, there are a couple who are embracing and each of them, round the back of the other, has a notebook and a <laughs> pen and they're doing that and, it, and, and, and it's the, it, the I think the, the, the sub subtitle or uh, title flashes on the screen saying artists in love <laughs> you know? um, I, I've, I've never had that self-consciousness fortunately mm -hmm. different sorts of self-consciousness but not, not to do with being a writer who mm. wrote that? Maupassant Maupassant ah, the great, ah. yes that, yes it's from Sur l'eau oh is it? Well, I've read that quite recently. I read, read a preface to that. <laughs> I, um, I hope to have remembered that. Go on. Can I make a jump? Be because when we were discussing what we were going to do tonight, 
the question was which were the latest books which Julian Barnes has written which have come out either in English or in French and they both happen to be books of essays um, and I would like you to uh, read something for us now from the latest book which has come out in English which are essays on art the title of the book is Keeping an Eye Open and this is a piece about a painter who was actually a local. I thought, as I haven't given a reading in Switzerland for a while, that a chapter about Vallotton would be a chapter to read from. Um, Vallotton is a completely unknown painter in Britain, and um, and I, I'll just read the first sort of three pages of this, um, which describe sort of how I, how I came to, um, how I discovered him in the first place and, um, and what, well, it's self-explanatory. I don't need to explain what I'm going to explain. Um, at the turn of the 20th century, the Cone sisters in Baltimore, Dr. Claribel and Miss Etta, inherited a fortune stitched together from cotton, denim and mattress ticking. They chose to spend it on art. Over the next decades, buying mainly in Paris, they put together with fine taste and the help of experts, including Leo and Gertrude Stein, a great assembly of Matisse, plus works by Picasso, Cézanne, Van Gogh, Seurat and Gauguin. Before Dr. Claribel died in 1929, she signed one of the most manipulative wills in the history of art. Her share of the collection would go in the first instance to her sister, with the, quote, suggestion but not a direction or obligation that after Etta's death, it passed to the local Museum of Art, quote, in the event the spirit of appreciation for modern art in Baltimore becomes improved. <laughs> Astonishing. This wonderful challenge from a dying woman to an entire city was coupled with the proposal or threat that the Metropolitan Museum in New York should be the fallback recipient. The next 20 years, up to Miss Etta's death in 1949, naturally contained some major politicking from the Metropolitan. But plucky little Baltimore eventually proved its fitness and modernity. The Cone Collection is now the main reason for visiting the Baltimore Museum of Art on the campus of Johns, Johns Hopkins University. When I was teaching there for a semester in the mid-90s, I used to call in at the museum between classes. At first, Matisse and the other big names occupied me, but the picture I found myself standing most faithfully in front of was a small, intense oil by the Swiss painter Felix Vallotton. It was called Le Mensonge, The Lie. There was another Vallotton in the collection, a massively brooding image of Gertrude Stein of 1907, which we are referencing um, that famous painting by Ingres called Monsieur Bertin. Do you know of the monumental one with the guy with his hands like that, who was a famous journalist at the time, which uh, we are wittily dubbed Madame Bertin. And this would undoubtedly become uh, Gertrude Stein's known public face had not Picasso stolen preeminence of the subject the previous year. But I was entrapped by The Lie, painted in 1897 and bought 30 years later by Etta Cohn from Felix, Felix's art-dealing brother Paul in Lausanne. It cost her 800 Swiss francs, no more than small change, given that on the same day and from the same source she bought a Degas pastel for 20,000 francs. One of my students, writing students, had handed in a story based around a mysterious lie, and so I found myself describing the Valaton to my class. And there's a very small black and white illustration here which you won't be able to see, but anyway. But the book will be up there and there you can see it in <laughs> colour. Uh, it's on the cover of the book, actually, at the back cover of the book. Um, a man and woman sit in a late 19th century interior, yellow and pink striped wallpaper in the background, blocky furniture in shades of dark red in the foreground. 
The couple are entwined on a sofa, her rich scarlet curves bedded between the black legs of his trousers. She is whispering in his ear. He has his eyes closed. Clearly, the woman is the liar, a fact confirmed by the smiling complacency of the man's expression and the, and the, and the way his left hook is cocked with the jauntiness of the unaware. All we might wonder is which lie he is being told. That old deceiver, I love you, or does the swell of the woman's dress invite the other favorite, of course the child is yours. <laughs> At my next class, several students reported back. One, the Canadian novelist Kate Stearns, politely told me that my reading was diametrically wrong. <laughs> For her, it was obvious that the man was the liar a fact confirmed by the smiling complacency of his expression and the jauntiness of his cocked foot. <laughs> his whole posture was one of smug mendacity, the woman's that of the plainly deceived. All we might wonder is which lie she is being told. If not, I love you, then perhaps that other male perennial, of course I'll marry you. Other students had other ideas. One cannily suggested that the title, rather than referring to a specific untruth, might be a broader allusion to that necessary lie of social convention which makes honest dealing between the sexes impossible. Valentin's use of colour might confirm this. On the left are the couple in sharply contrasted colours, and on the right a scarlet armchair blends seamlessly with a scarlet tablecloth. Furnishings can harmonize, we might conclude, humans not. Valaton, like compa compatriots as various as Lyotard, Le Corbusier and Godard, did that Swiss thing of appearing to the outside world to be French. Indeed, Valaton went further, and a year after marrying into the Parisian art-dealing fam family of Bernheim in 1899, he took French citizenship. It's interesting, both Vuillard, he was a great friend of Bonnard and, uh, and um, Vuillard, and all three were offered the Légion d'honneur at the same time, and all three of them turned it down, uh, which is surprising for, for Veloton, because you think you take French citizenship and then you accept the honours that they offer you. Anyway, so they're all dead against that. Where was I? Um, he was a member of the Nabi group and a lifelong friend of Vuillard, not that any of this raised his profile in Britain. Baltimore was the first place I registered Valaton's name, and British gallery goers needn't be embarrassed if they find it unfamiliar. Any embarrassment belongs better to the nation's art acquirers. In Britain, he is not so much the forgotten Nubby as the unknown Nubby. There has never been a public exhibition of his paintings in this country, though in 1976 there was a touring show of his woodcuts. A recent check with the Fondation Félix Valaton in Lausanne revealed that we, have, that we, i.e. Britain, has only a single painting of his in public ownership, Road at St. Paul, uh, Road at Saint Paul, 1922, which belongs to the Tate only because it was donated by Paul Valaton after his brother's death. It hasn't been displayed since 1993, nor has it been loaned out in that time either. The main holdings of his work are in the major Swiss cities and, and at the Musée d'Orsay. Elsewhere, you will rarely come across more than a couple of his pictures hanging together. Many of them, including some of his best, are still in private hands and don't emerge even at the invitation of powerful curators. Valaton has often been undervalued, even patronized. Gertrude Stein snootily called him a manet for the impecunious. But there is another reason why he is bypassed. His output was large, and he is a painter who, more than any other I can think of, ranges from high quality to fierce awfulness. The Musée des Beaux-Arts in Rouen, for example, has two Valetons on display in a rather dingy, overhung corridor. One is a theatre study of nine tiny blackish heads peering down over a gallery rail and made speck-like by the vast creamy yellow bulge of the balcony front beneath them. It has none of the busy impressionism, the shifting light and guilt of, say, Degas, 
or Sickert's theatre work. It is rich yet spare in tone, a fine study of the propinquitous isolation of modern city life. But on the opposite wall of the corridor is a nude of such turn your back dreadfulness that had you seen it first, you might have noticed, noted the artist's name in order to ensure that in future you avoided his work at all costs. <laughs> a Swiss friend of mine, a Swiss friend of mine, <laughs> once asked me ruefully, but have you ever seen a good nude by Balaton? Um, we're going to wrap this up very soon, but um, Julian Barnes does not only write about Valotan, he is going to change things in Britain because he's going to curate the first ever Valotan exhibition, which will be at the Royal Academy. Royal Academy in uh, 2019. Actually, not co curate. It, uh, I have to say that. I, was, I, I mean, I, I, it was my idea. I, put, I suggested it to them, but I have to have a professional curator. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to do it. I wouldn't have the, I wouldn't have the mouse, the, the art world, to be able to do it. But um, yes, I'm quite proud that it's going to happen. And about time, too, as well, because <laughs> he is a wonderful painter. Um, I think this is a moment where we can open things up to questions from the audience. Now, who will be the courageous first person? Ah, there's a courageous person over there. Uh, wait, could you please wait for the... You will get a microphone. There, look. You mentioned your use of uh, various types of diaries. And I was wondering, uh, is this priority for you to go back to them uh, for ideas or to refresh your memory? Or is it, uh, do you keep diaries mainly to hone your craft, to practice your writing? Or how, how do you exploit your diaries, if you do? Um, I, it's now become such a habit that I can't stop. And so I do it with, without really thinking what I'm doing it for. Um, I, I, I do it, I think I do it because I mistrust my memory and I want to record anything that I think is interesting. But I don't distinguish when I'm recording things between me maybe wanting to remember them exactly as a a human being and a citizen of my country as opposed to looking back and remembering them and using them as a writer because as I said at the time of writing I have no idea whether they're going to be any use at all um, I think I think uh, I think it's more that the actual writing down of something um, it reinforces the memory of it and therefore, I'm more likely to remember it if I write it down, even if I don't then go and look it up. Um, but things that people say, you know, I know that um, if I write them down, I've got more chance of remembering them as well as having them, you know, stored there for me. But uh, I, I don't ever think, oh, I haven't got, got, I haven't got any ideas. Maybe if I went through my diary, I'd find something to write about. I, I, it doesn't work like that. It's, it's rather mysterious in a way, but I quite like it being mysterious. Um. Yeah, thank you very much. You, you mentioned in your conversation earlier, the two of you, you mentioned that, oh, I'm contradicting myself. My question is, why shouldn't you contradict yourself? Your people you have described their lives and inner lives are also contradicting themselves. Why shouldn't you have the right to contradict yourself? You have just told Mr. Bodenow yes. a few days ago and what you told him yes. right. I know. I'm with you. I think <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I agree. I think I do have the right to contradict myself. Um, I, I, I think it, it becomes, isn't that that line of, does anyone here know that Walt Whitman poem which goes something like, oh, I contradict myself, of course I contradict myself, I contain multitudes. 
you know that? No? I didn't like the sound of it. Um, <laughs> uh, I think there can be something a bit melodramatic about being self-contradictory. But of course we do. We do, contra and we, uh, just as we, we, change our, we change our opinions and our, and our values and our natures, and we aren't aware of it until someone else points it out. I think that's why it's important, because he picks me up on saying the opposite of what I said two days ago. Yes? If I just have a follow-up question on the same theme, the follow-up question is, when, when you write, you have a character that develops, yes. and it develops somewhat while you write the character. Is this non-contradiction an important element, or does it add fullness to the character's personality? Um, I don't think I can answer that. Um, it's very... I mean, I think, all, I think when you're writing any character, it's very rare that a character doesn't contain contradictions. And um, uh, maybe some sort of very, some, some saintly character with a very attenuated uh, personality and life might not contradict themselves. Um, but, but we all do in one way or another. And so I don't actually think of it, um, I don't think of it when I'm writing, ah, this is the point where he, he must say something that we thought he, he didn't believe in previously. It, it's it's at, at the level, the, the way in which you're operating when, you're, when you've got a character who's already there alive in your mind is that it, that sort of com comes out in the writing almost inevitably. You know, you, 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 th you know this character and you're representing this character and therefore the contradictions and complexities just sort of come into your knowledge of him or her. So, okay. Um, I was going to ask about this moment when, um, once you finish to work on your book and uh, it's published and it comes for the first time uh, at your home and do you read it? Do you become a reader uh, and why? Or maybe you don't. And of my own book? Yes, your own book. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, I mean, the, by the time... I've just finished a novel, and by the time I've finished a novel, I s I'm so weary of read, reading it through. And um, I'm so relieved to get it out of the house that when it comes back, I'll say, oh, yes, I remember you. Um, but I wouldn't sit down and read it, no, I, I, I don't think so. The, the only time it happens, which is curious, is when I get the French translations of my books, and I always get the typescripts of those, and I read them through. And um, at the, 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 I mean, sometimes it's just very, it's very like hard work, but sometimes I get caught up in the story, and I find myself because because you know French and English are so different that that you feel you're almost reading a French novel, and then you're reading a French novel that you don't quite know what happens next, and that's really exciting, you know. Um, I suppose one should be suspicious of that, that that if it's you might be reading something that has no connection with what you wrote, but I, no, I have a very good translator. And, uh, but, but those moments do occur, which are nice, but I don't think I could possibly do that. Um, you know, it, uh, as you saw when I read that paragraph, which I confess I had read uh, in the green room about half an hour before, um, but I did immediately think, oh, how would I do it now? How would I do it differently now? And so I think, um, uh, I think that it's, it's, it's almost self-defense not to read something. Because on the one hand, you think, oh, that, I could improve that sentence. And then on the other hand, you think, I wonder if I could write a sentence as good as that now, you know, about the next sentence. So I think it's, it's probably best kept, a, kept away. It's like, you know, not looking. I don't look back at my books and, and think that book led to this and so on. Uh, uh, so, yes, next. Yes, I'm just interested to know why you wrote under a pseudonym. Why I? Why, why, why did you write under a pseudonym at some point? To oh, Kavanaugh. Um, I, well, I, my first novel, Metroland, 
which begins with that memorable first sentence, which I've already forgotten. Um, um, it took me about seven or eight years to write, and it was only about 170 pages long. And then I, and I was quite keen on reading thrillers at that time, and, and I, I thought I'd try writing a thriller, and it took me 10 days. And I realized that I quite wanted to go on doing both. And I remembered a story of a thriller writer who'd written, um, he'd, who'd used his own name. He was a man called Julian Simmons, who was a crime novelist and crime reviewer. And he wrote a series of novels for a publisher called Victor Galantz. And he, um, he wrote a lot of crime novels. And then he went in to see his publisher and he said, um, I think I might write a straight novel now. And the publisher said, yes, but you've used up your own name. <laughs> your name is attached to this detective fiction you've written. And so, so I felt that if, if I wrote one called straight novel in seven years, then a thriller in ten days, and I was going to go on, I might find that I was overpowering my straight fiction with my crime novels, and that I'd, so I just wanted to keep the names distinct. And in fact, old Dan Kavanagh is a lazy old bugger. He hasn't written anything for decades. <laughs> he hasn't written anything for about 30 years, nearly 30 years. So he can be put on one side, though I don't disown him. 28 years, yes. What? 28 years, that's true. Which is unfortunate, actually. Mm. And one also has to say something. Um, Julian Barnes' wife, Pat Kavanagh, which is where the name comes from, she loved the Duffy novels, and, and usually Julian would do everything for Pat. And so once, when she, uh, when he asked her, what do you want for your birthday? She said, another Duffy. <laughs> and that was probably the, the only time you ever disappointed she, her. She didn't get the present she wanted, no. no. It's true. Yes. So you, you already talked quite a bit about the, let's say, creative process and, and the analytical side of it and, and um, that you actually analyze everything that happens to you, that you uh, write down, uh, that you have a diary, and the other side, which is more, let's say, the form side, and you also quoted Fl Flaubert on that, that you have the form side and, and, and the other is the content side, let's say, those both sides coexist. Um, Flaubert actually also, uh, at some point, I, I think you said, um, um, la beauté, c'est quand l'expression colle sur la pensée. And I think that's actually also kind of uh, expressing those two sides. It is more the, the let's say, content and, and more the, um, uh, and, uh, and the, the form. And, and I think just what, what I'm, I'm wondering is, like, let's say, as, as a writer, and I think that's really what is, is probably so difficult, is that it, it's not enough to be a stylist not enough to be someone who's analytical and who has good ideas, you actually need to combine both of those things. And, and for me, um, as, as a non-writer, I would think of those things as almost two different um, uh, métiers, you know, that you, um, that you have to combine in order to be able to, to, to write good novels. So, so my question would be, do you see those things as somewhat separate? Do you see those things as one holistic um, um, thing that goes together. Um, what, what's your views on, on, on that? Um, well, when I was uh, at school and we were taught literature, um, we, we, we were sort of given a piece of prose or given a piece of poetry, and um, you know we we would analyse it under you know, theme, tone, um, language, style, la la la, and various. And part of, part of me thought that this must be what writers did too, you know, that they had, that they had a series of boxes and they had to sort of tick them. Um, and it wasn't until I became a writer that I realised how unhelpful this way of approaching literature really is to break it down into those, um, those little sections and, 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 and imagine that the writer thinks, oh, uh, will this be an ironical book or will this be a solemn book? You know, it's, you, never, you never find those sorts of um, questions 
coming into your mind. You're way past those questions by the time you even start thinking about writing it. Um, and so sometimes books are best described. I mean, Flaubert said um, of Madame Bovary that he thought of it as, as, as having a sort of slightly grey, green, mouldy colour to it. Something like, it was something like that, don't quote it exactly. And, and, and so sometimes writers, when they think about their books, ha have some metaphor like that, which is the way that they envisage them. Um, having said that, what I said earlier about that moment of form and content coming together, uh, I, do, I do profoundly believe in, and I've had exact experience of it several times in my writing, and uh, of course, it's not always that moment where you hear the electric, the way you hear the wire, the buzz from the crossing wires. But I've, I've, I wrote, wrote a novel called Talking It Over, um, which is um, it's a, a story of the emotional life told from the points of view of all the characters who, are one after another, address the, the reader and try to convince the reader of their point of view and the correctness of their point of view. And I had heard the story of the basic events of the book, which was real, had a real life beginning of um, two best friends and on the day that best friend A marries his love, the second man realizes he's in love with her, with the, with the new wife, and, and moves in opposite their house and lays siege to the wife and eventually wins her. Uh, that's all I knew. I didn't know, I just vaguely knew who one of the people were, was. But that lay in my head for 10 years until I realized, ah, it's a, I want to tell it in a very intimate way. And this intimate way of each character just whispering in the reader's ear and hearing sometimes a strange stereophony as well when they're both trying to whisper at the same time and tell you different things. That might work. So that's, that's the clearest example I can give of this, of this moment. Um, but the process uh, is, is not one that you reflect on at the time you're doing it in terms of, you know, should I be... Should I be a bit more ironic here? Should I do that? Sh should the colouring be different? You're often on very small practical things of how you get around the next problem or how you get rid of that bad sentence. And this is not something I would have thought before I became a novelist, that, that, that somehow, often without thinking about them, You've already made s several decisions about the book before you realise it's a book you're going to write. Uh, there's someone up there. Um, you you uh, mentioned very much in passing uh, a point where you stopped being autobiographical and started writing works of fiction. Can you anything more about that process? Um, this, I think you're referring to my first novel where I said that the first section was autobiographical in spirit, though not in detail, and then I learnt <coughs> uh, I learnt to write fiction or I learnt to lie or I learnt to get away with it. Um, I think it was it was it It was that thing of, well, I've got to start with my life. I've got to start with something close to my life because that's what I understand. And then I'll see if I get, any com get my confidence. And um, the comparison I would make is maybe you, you're, you're stepping out onto a, some ice, frozen lake or something, and you're not you don't want to leave the ground, the, the earth of reality. And then after a while you find that you can move on it and then you're somehow skating. Hmm. Uh, 
Sorry, that's all I can say. <laughs> I, I think this is actually a, a wonderful moment where we can say that was it. And if anybody has more questions, Julian Barnes will be signing books up there and the others can have an aperitif over there. I'm told that everyone has to have an aperitif first. <laughs> so you have to go into there and then you'll discover that they're laced with some mysterious element which makes you want to rush to the bookstore. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.